coming in the fall. I really can't say much about it, but you know, uh, I can say that it's coming. So, yes, of course, absolutely. You know, it's it's an ever changing, very dynamic kind of an uh, you know industry, the student recruitment, and we face that with a lot of our universities, and that is we just have to cope up with that. I've received an email with certain changes, and I think Asif is also a copy on that. So I think it's amazing yes. that we can shed light on that as well uh, within the presentation. And uh, of course, yes, we have faced um, the few things that we must address uh, with regards to housing application, and I think this is the reason we wanted to kind of exclusively promote one of this, you know, our universities on the panel, which is Herzing, uh, because that is the only one that is not on the gateway as yet. So uh, we just want to exclusively work on this one. And then, of course, you know, we'll, we already have established a certain um, network within the Pakistan uh, recruitment market. At the same time, we received an exceptional uh, visa ratio for housing, uh, especially. So I feel like it's, it's a great um, institution to start with. And uh, yeah, I think um, it's, it's going to be great. Thank you, Anissa, so much uh, for joining in and uh, giving us the opportunity to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Again, no problem. And uh, speaking of the Gus Gateway, we are looking to be on the Gateway uh, very soon. So we have our uh, IT tech team. They're currently working on a project um, with the NUNI team to try to accommodate that, hopefully uh, by the end of the month. Amazing. I think that would be great. Um, Shataj, are we good to start? Uh, yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. Amazing. All right. Um, okay. Anissa? Yes, we should start. Anissa, you, you can share your screen with us as well, and then, then you can start the presentation. Please go ahead. Absolutely. Oh. All right, thank you. So welcome, everyone, uh, to... Uh, Today's presentation from Herzing University. Um, we're here today with our friends from Pakistan to uh, share information about Herzing University with those who are interested in learning and students that may be interested in coming to the USA to study. Um, I um, am uh, gonna be your speaker here, Anessa Neal today. I am from Herzing University and we have several members of the team here uh, that I will let introduce their self if that's okay. Um, Asif? Yes, you can proceed. Of course. Um, so we have with us um, Asif, who uh, looks after, who's a country manager for Hussein University, looking after Pakistan market. Uh, my name is Farah Khan, and I'm the portfolio head for um, USA University sitting in uni. And then we have Shahtaj from Hello, Ocean everybody. One, who will be um, co-hosting the uh, webinar for us. Thank you so much, Anissa. Thank you, guys. Oh, again, this was me. Uh, my name again is Anessa Neal. I'm the Director of International Admissions and Operations for Herzing University. Um, and it, it, my team uh, is the team that processes and uh, manages all the applications that come in from uh, in uni and in any of the markets that we have. We have a, a good team here that uh, processes quickly um, and are very communicative and uh, you know process all facets of the international application. So from the electronic part that comes in to each of the documents, foreign credential evaluations, acceptances, I-20s, um, all of that is managed under my team. Um, I wish they would have been able to all be here today, but that would have made for a lot of speakers. So we'll stick with me and um, hopefully I'll be able to answer all of your questions today. Um, so a little about Herzing University. Um, the, we have multiple campuses across the United States, but we recruit international students to our campus that's located in Atlanta, Georgia. And so if you see here, um, this picture of the United States, uh, you'll see the Atlanta uh, and Georgia are located in the southeastern part of the country. Um, the great thing about this space in the United States is, um, is mostly the weather. So that's the reason why we selected the Atlanta campus as the international location or the international uh, recruitment site for most of our international students. Is because most of our other ca campus locations are further up north. The weather there is not... Uh, as nice, it's a little colder there. They receive a lot of snow throughout the year. And so we felt like this location was one that was gonna be a bit more suitable for international students, particularly those coming from Southeast Asia that uh, come from a warmer climate. Um, and a little, a few uh, facts about Herzing University. Um, we are 
convenient, flexible, and career-focused undergraduate and graduate degrees. And that's important because uh, we want to make sure you understand that Herzing University provides more hands-on training, more example-based training, uh, more real-life type training than what many of you may be uh, familiar with. So lots of uh, universities provide mostly only lectures and exams. And Herzing University does a lot of lecture-based learning, a lot of hands-on learning, so teaching by doing. Um, and then a lot of this is obviously taking place in the classroom with lots of materials, uh, homework assignments, and things like that. So um, also, we have quite innovative programs on our campus, and we really work hard to be sure that we can support our students in all the ways that we can. Um, and this is our domestic students and our international students. And the, both sets of those students have two different sets of support needs. And so we try to do our best to make sure that we focus individually on each group of students and make sure that everyone has all of the things that they need to be successful. Um, also, as far as actual processing is concerned, um, I just mentioned the great team that I have here. We do process applications rel relatively quickly. Um, we do often have some partners come back and say, but but we submitted this. It wasn't processed quickly. What happened? Um, and what usually happens with that is somehow the communication didn't get back to the partner, whether it was sent through the email address that the student used to um, do their actual application, whether it was information sent through the partner to the to the agent. Um, but I can guarantee you things were processed if they were provided to us within 48 hours of receiving them. Um, so if for some reason you are going through this process and you feel like your application has stalled, um, reach out to us and let us know like, hey, you know, I submitted these things. I really feel like these should be processed by now. You know, am I going to be accepted? Was, was something wrong with my requirements? Uh, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to answer those questions um, as quickly as we can. Um, additionally, we've got quite competitive fees as uh, compared to other universities in the U.S. And we're going to dig into those in detail in just a bit. Um, and then I already actually mentioned the location here in Southeast uh, USA, which I think is quite suitable for international learners. So um, a little about the background of Herzing University. We were founded in 1965 by Henry and Suzanne Herzing. Um, and while Henry and Suzanne Herzing don't take such an active role in the university today, their daughter Renee Herzing is actually the president of Herzing University. Um, and so we still very much run with the legacy of the family, the initial beliefs of the family, um, and the, the values of the family are still very much in play um, at Herzing University. Um, and I can tell you, I've been at Herzing University myself for, uh, I think, about 17 years, going on 18 years, and it's a wonderful environment to work in um, and a wonderful environment for students as well. Um, also, Herzing University is accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. Um, this is a regional accreditation, which is essentially a set of standards that um, are set forth by this accrediting body that Herzing University is responsible for maintaining and meeting in order to maintain their accreditation with uh, the Higher Learning Commission. And then Herzing University is a private nonprofit university. Um, we have more than 40,000 graduates to date and that I think we're actually closer to 50,000. We just haven't quite hit that mark yet, but soon we'll be hitting that 50,000 mark and then we'll be updating this presentation. Um, and then we've got 11 U.S. campuses and an online division. Um, so, again, we're quite spread across the United States, um, but we do keep the international students, particularly at the Atlanta campus, because we have definitely found that they're much happier there with a similar uh, environment to their own homes. Um, and then also you can see uh, down to the left, the right hand side of the slide um, for 11, 11 consecutive years, we have been on all of these uh, top lists on US News and World Report. Um, something pretty easy to go on and research if you'd like to see them, but you can go and look at Persing University on US News and World Report and see um, all the accolades there. In addition to these, these are just the ones that we've had for the last 11 consecutive years. And then I mentioned already um, about the values of the family uh, that started Herzing University. And now that we're a nonprofit, uh, the family doesn't fully run the university anymore, even though Renee Herzing is the president. Um, we are operated by a board. Um, and the mission of the university that has been approved by the board and uh, was also uh, received input from employees all across uh, Herzing University. And the mission for the university is to educate, support, and empower all students for work and success. I'm sorry, for, 
I'm sorry, let me start over. To educate, support, and empower all students for success in work, learning, and engagement in our communities and our global society. So this means we want to prepare students for work in, in any place, whether it's in our own local community, if someone's gonna be staying in the city of Atlanta or in the city that they've graduated from, or it's somewhere else in the country or somewhere else on the globe. So um, really important, um, this is kind of something that, this mission is something we kind of check all of our main initiatives by. Does this initiative meet the goals of our mission? And then um, a little more about the support at Herzing. So I mentioned earlier, we really do a lot to make sure that we can support our students, whether they're our domestic students or our international students who again have very separate sets of needs, right? Um, these are some of the ways that we do this. Um, we do this with uh, accelerated classes. Um, you can take up to three semesters per academic year at Herzing. Um, this allows for year-round equal semester courses. Um, so it's possible that you could get a bachelor's degree in three years. I will say most of our international students don't take this route. So it's possible to do it across the typical four years, taking off one semester um, over the year if that's what students want to do. But we do have some students that do this. Um, and even with the master's degrees that we offer, you can finish that degree program in, in as little as 16 months if you go through classes without taking that break. Um, and so students are able to do this because we do offer three equal semesters in a year, um, where most U.S. universities offer really long spring and fall semesters and more compact uh, summer semesters that really make it you know, almost impossible to take a full-time course load over the course of that summer semester. Um, also, we offer guided education, which basically means pathways to advance amongst our uh, different degree programs and offerings. So um, for our undergraduate students, we offer a dual credit option. And this is an option that allows an undergraduate bachelor's degree seeking student to take up to 12 credit hours on the master's level that will apply to their undergraduate bachelor's degree and apply to their master's degree. So overall, saving them an entire semester plus of study and saving them over 10,000 US dollars on the completion of those two degrees. And this is something that uh, international students do really like to take advantage of. Um, in their last two semesters of their undergraduate degree program, they're able to take and register for those four master's degree level courses. Um, and again, the, the time and money that it saves is, is really valuable for international students and, and all students, truly, uh, domestic and students included. Um, we offer engaged education, which is a real uh, practical, real world approach to learning. I talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, small class sizes with an average class size ratio of around 14 students per professor um, that are able to promote higher levels of uh, personal engagement and teaching. So students have more, uh, more valuable relationships with their professors, um, you know, being able to go to them directly, being able to know them by name, maybe they'll have the same professor for more than one class and they'll be able to have a strong relationship with them, maybe use them as a reference later when they're looking for employment. Um, and it's really nice to have these closer relationships with the students and the faculty. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, thank you. And then um, some value added uh, faculty members are industry leaders trained in, in cultural diversity, teaching and demand knowledge and skills to support marketable and career ready graduates. And then lastly, supported, which is one that, again, is really important and really near to me, um, is a student centered approach with a lot of resources that are accessible to support students from the big from graduation and beyond. And I don't believe that we included this slide here today, but some of those support services include tutoring services on campus, um, student services advisors on campus for academic advising, immigration advising if it's needed, um, things like um, career support. So when someone's ready to look for an internship or for um, employment after graduation, we have a career readiness team that will help with that. Um, uh, mental illness support, uh, counseling support. Uh, we have so many resources on campus. Um, again, I don't believe we included those here, so I think now's a good time to mention them. Um, but students will uh, learn about all of these things as they come to orientation so that they can take advantage of them if they need to. 
Sounds good. Um, so as far as our programs are concerned, I, I'm not going to go into a great deal of information about the programs today. I'm going to share some kind of high level programs and what they are. However, they're all available on our website. If you go to herzing.edu, you'll see very detailed information down to every single class that a student will take, the number of credit hours, the goals for the class, the, the description for the class. Um, so please, if you are interested in seeing more details, please visit the website for that. So in our technology programs, we offer a Bachelor of Science in Information Technology and a Bachelor of Science in Information Technology with a concentration in data analytics. Um, data analytics is kind of a hot topic right now. Uh, lots of students are really interested in data analytics. And the really great thing about both of these programs is they are both STEM eligible programs. And for those of you that don't know what that means, it essentially means that the uh, Department of Ed and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security have deemed these programs uh, STEM eligible. STEM is S-T-E-M, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And it allows students to apply for an additional two years of STEM OPT, which is your optional practical training, after you complete your first year of OPT. So allowing for students to apply for up to three years of uh, work authorization in the United States. So really popular programs, really popular path for international students um, to take. So this, the STEM programs, um, as far as technology, pretty much any technology program you see is, is usually going to be STEM, especially on the undergrad level. Um, and if you guys have more questions about that, you know, I'm happy to answer those too. And there's lots of information online about uh, STEM programs. Then under our business program, we offer a Bachelor of Science in, in Business Management. That's a traditional three to four year if you take the regular path, three year if you take the accelerated path, uh, undergraduate business program. And then we offer an MBA with multiple concentrations. So you can do a general MBA, you can do an MBA with data analytics, an MBA with project management, healthcare management, or technology management. And what I want to say about that grouping of MBA programs that I just said is that those programs are not STEM eligible programs. However, you would be eligible for uh, one year of OPT after graduation where you would be allowed to work or apply to work in the U.S. for one year. Um, and I can't say a whole lot about this, and I talked to SF about it before we hopped on the call, but we do have a brand new STEM MBA program that is going to be launching uh, for our fall semester. So students will be able to apply for that program uh, sometime around mid-May. Right now, our anticip anticipated launch date for that program is May the 20th. Um, by May 20th, it'll be on the website. It'll be available in our application portal to accept applications. Um, but it is not there yet. This program is going to be called an MBA or Master of Business Administration in Business Analytics. And it will be eligible for that STEM extension OPT whenever we get it. And the first um, start date that it will be available for will be the fall uh, 2024 intake. So I believe this is the only program that I really went into a lot of detail about, and it's the Master of Business Administration. Um, and the program requires 33 to 36 credit hours for graduation, depending on your undergraduate degree. But I wanted to share with you the list of classes and kind of a framework of what that would look like. So um, students in the MBA program, you can select a specialization or not. Again, one of those specializations will be that business analytics specialization that will be available come, uh, for the September intake. Um, and then most students take nine semester credit hours per semester for this program, allowing them to finish in four semesters. So if you go straight through without taking any semester breaks, students can finish this program in as little as 16 months. If you do take a break, your break would be for four months and then that would put you at finishing the program in 20 total months, but with four of those months with absolutely no coursework or enrollment. Um, so both paths are great. I will say about 50% of our students do each one. Neither path is better than the other. Um, but then the classes that you see, the 10 classes there in the middle are the, the uh, main classes for the program. Um, when the STEM MBA and business analytics launches, um, there, some of those classes will be different, but for all of the other specializations that I mentioned, these are the 10 core classes for that. And then you'll have three 
um, specialization courses in addition to that based on whichever specialization you choose. If it's project management, healthcare management, technology management, and so on. All right, now what we all wanna to know today is what are our admissions requirements? So let's hop into that. Um, and then um, if it's okay with you guys, um, I think when I get done, get through the requirements, it's gonna be this slide and one more for undergraduate. I'll give you a second to see if you guys have any questions about it. And then we'll do the same with the undergraduate slides. Um, and sure. I know we may be taking some questions uh, via chat at some point, um, but sometimes international admissions requirements can be confusing. So I wanna make sure that everybody is on the same page and everybody has a good understanding. Um, and I'll say our undergraduate and our graduate admissions requirements are very similar. There are just a couple of things that are a little bit different based on the requirements for that master's level versus that bachelor's level study. Um, so I'll focus on the undergrad for this and then I'll move on to the, the graduate after that. So all bachelor's programs at Herzing University require the items on this slide. And then I'll, again, I have one more slide after that that talks about the admissions exam. So um, electronic application. Um, at this point, this is the, the link to the electronic application. Um, it's obviously very long, so I'm happy to email this out to anyone so we can make sure we don't make any mistakes uh, in the link. Um, and this is the Herzing University uh, application portal. Uh, it's called the Herzing Hub. Um, Herzing Connect, actually. This one's called Herzing Connect on your side. Um, so you'll go to this link, create an account, you'll verify the email that you created that account with, um, and then you'll log back in and then start through the electronic details of the application. So, you know, what's your name, what's your address, your educational history, your emergency contact, those kinds of things, what program do you want to do, your start date, and so on. Um, I will say today, this is the link for the application, but we are working on uh, soon getting onto the Gus Gateway, which is something that I think will be uh, really great for everyone. It'll be a little bit more streamlined application process from the perspective of an international student, um, where our current application portal um, has a lot of things in there that may be confusing for an international student as far as start dates and program selection. And so I think moving on to the Gus Gateway is gonna be uh, really positive for all international students. Um, and then also, so after you, you're, you've done that electronic application form, uh, let's see, in uni actually has a registration form, I believe, um, that needs to be filled out. Um, kind of same information, your name, your email, your phone number, um, you know, what program you're interested in, what country you live in, and those kinds of things. Um, also next, and this will be for all students, a valid passport. So in order to apply for a visa, you've got to have a passport um, and that passport needs to be valid at least six months beyond the start date that you've selected. So for example, if you intend to start classes in September of 2024, your, your passport needs to be valid for six months beyond that date. Um, also financial statements and affidavit of support. Um, you've got to be able to show the U.S. government that you can support yourself while you're in school. Um, and so the, a minimum of 30,000 U.S. dollars is required. Um, it can be in any currency. We will convert it for you. That's no problem. But it needs to be a recent financial statement, less than 60 days old. And if the money doesn't belong to the student, we'll need an affidavit of support to go along with it. So if the money belongs to the father of the student, the uncle of the student, brother, sister, mother, anyone. We just need an affidavit of support to go along with that. And if the affidavit mentions the relationship, it does speed up the process. Sometimes it's really easy to tell what the relationship is based on names, but sometimes it isn't easy to tell. And if we just assume it's the father and we write father on the I-20, sometimes the students come back and say, oh no, this is my uncle or my sister or my brother. So if the affidavit could mention the relationship, that is very helpful. Um, and those items are uploaded together as one single document onto the application portal. Um, there's an application fee of $50 to be paid online. And there's a couple of options in which you can pay that. Flywire is the way I recommend. Um, Flywire is uh, accepts all US payments, any kind of US debit cards, uh, credit cards, anything like that. It's really easy to pay via Flywire. Um, but there is also a way that you can pay on our website. Uh, through our U.S. payment system. I don't recommend it, but we do have students that do it all the time. Um, so maybe for some, it's a better way. Um, proof of language requirements. 
Um, so our IELTS exam minimum of 5.5, TOEFL exam minimum is going to be a 61. Um, Duolingo is a minimum of 95. And just added two weeks ago, we are now accepting the PTE academic. Um, the PTE academic minimum score for bachelor's degree applicants is going to be a 44. Um, and then we have uh, previous education requirements. And for someone applying for the bachelor's degree program, um, it would be your uh, 10 and your plus two typically. Um, but basically your uh, secondary and your higher secondary transcripts and certificates that show that you were indeed award awarded that uh, degree. And then those can be unofficial. There's no need for those to be official. Um, and then a suitability interview that is done uh, by the team at NUNI. And then lastly, um, admissions requirements for the uh, bachelor's degree seeking students is students will receive um, a, a pretty much as, almost as soon as they fill out that electronic application within 24 hours, they'll receive um, a testing link to take an exam called the Wonderlick exam. Um, this is an eight minute exam that we use for the purpose of acceptance to Herzing University. And then to accompany that, you'll see two other exams that are for placement and math and English. And so um, these exams are mandatory exams to take for Herzing. We use them in place of like an SAT or an ACT that you may see some universities have requirements for. Um, we do feel like it can be difficult to take the SAT or the ACT, especially when you're in a foreign market. So um, in order to try to close that gap, we have this um, Wonderlick assessment available for all students, but international students. It's takeable. You, you receive the link electronically. It comes by your email. Um, and as long as you have a good internet connection and you can be somewhere for, you know, 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes that you have minimal interruptions, um, you know, it's it's a pretty, pretty quick and easy way to uh, go through the testing process there. So um, I want to take a minute and see if um, our Pakistan team has any questions about the admissions requirements, because if you guys uh, have questions, students probably yes, will I as well. I would like to ask a couple of questions. Yes, please, Shataj. Thank you. So how long it will take to receive assessment mail after the, the application? Assessment. Yeah, it comes within about 24 hours. Um, okay. I will say sometimes, so this is manually sent by the team, um, but, and this is not include weekends. So we work Monday through Friday. So obviously there's a time difference as well. So I'll tell you right now here in Atlanta, it's 8 a.m. We, we got on this call at 7 a.m. So you know, noting the time difference and noting that we aren't in the office on Saturday and Sunday, um, someone who applied on Friday should get it by Monday morning our time. So um, usually within 24 working hours, a student would receive this. We have had reports of it going to a student's junk mail. So students should definitely check that junk mail file if they're expecting this exam, if they don't see it. Um, but we don't get a ton of reports of it going to junk mail, but it, it does happen, obviously, but usually within 24 hours. Um, and a lot of the issue that we find is because students aren't using their own emails to do mm -hmm. the application. And when they're using emails that they don't check often, they, aren't che they don't realize that they've received this exam. And so uh, that's one of the things that we'll get into later is it's really important that whatever email address a student uses to fill out that electronic application we mentioned, it's really important that they use something that they check very regularly and often, because if they don't, they're not getting any communication back from the university about the status of their application. And this is one of those things that's really important to, to go ahead and take. And then once the student actually takes the exam, within 24 hours of that, we'll have their result published um, and we'll know if they passed, um, if they need to take it again. So one of the exams does have three attempts, the shorter eight minute one. Most students pass it on the first time, but if for some reason they don't pass it, they do get a chance to take it again after a 24 hour waiting period. And in very, very rare circumstance, if they don't pass it the second time, we can give it to them again a third time, but we have to wait 14 days before we can send it the third time. Okay, so we have to wait, the students have to wait for 14 days for the third attempt, right? Yes, 14 days. Okay, and the placement assessments, there are no retakes. No retake. So that one is, is basically for us to determine what level the student is in math and English. So we want to get a clear picture of that. So if they need a more supportive math or a more supportive English class, we want to make sure we put them in that class. 
Um, and I want to point out too, this exam is given to domestic students as well. So this is not just an exam for international students. So even our U.S. citizen domestic students take this exam because, again, we try to create that environment of support as much as possible. And if they need that additional support in a class, we want to be sure we can give that to them. And these math and English assessments help us do that. Okay. Okay. I have one question, Anissa, on behalf of students. Sure. Uh, that uh, regarding the uh, uh, what is uh, what there is a basically one exciting news regarding the STEM MBA. Basically, we were looking in the, the recent past regarding the STEM MBA because we were lacking in that particular field. So, as far as the uh, STEM MBA is concerned, do we consider any sort of uh, background uh, related with the MBA degree or not? Or we are accepting from any background for the graduation field? Yeah, it can be from any background. So, um, there is. Currently, our MBA program is 33 or 36 credit hours, and that 36 credit hour, the, the, that, that three credit hour difference depends on your background. So if you don't have a background in business, um, you will need to take what we call a leveling course. So it's a basic business level course that kind of gives you um, a quick overview of all the basic business uh things that you would need to know to be successful in that program. So someone who came from a background of IT or tourism or hospitality or anything, you know, nursing, whatever, we would give them that leveling course so that it will prepare them to be successful in the other courses. Perfect, sounds good. And uh, do you have any question for the further question, Shadaj? Uh, yeah, I wanna ask that the requirements are the same for all the programs for undergraduate? Yes, they are. Okay. Just a quick question for me as well. Um, so, Anisa, we follow the local um, board intermediate system in Pakistan, which is basically grade 10 and grade 12. But sure. we also have a lot of schools uh, who follow the British curriculum, which is the ONA levels, right? So for the ONA level students, there's a lot of uh, general consensus in the market that um, you will be waived off with the language requirement. Is that correct for um, Hazing as well? Um, are, are, are you saying that these students are finishing, um, basically so they, they're finishing school with the, the Cambridge assessments? Yes. Yes. Um, I've not considered that before. Um, I don't know of a lot of universities that are doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, I can research it and come back to you, but at this point, no, a student that uh, did is not from a country that the primary language there is English would need to take an English language assessment. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. Okay. I don't think so. There, is, there are any further questions. So I think so you can proceed further. Anissa. Sure. So next I'll move on to the tuition for the undergraduate program. Here we go. Um, I'm just going to go over this quickly. This tuition is, uh, pretty close to what the tuition has been for a really long time at Herzing University. Um, but essentially, um, we've made some adjustments to our tuition to allow for scholarships to international students and international students will receive a scholarship of $5,000 per semester, which comes up to a total of $10,000 per academic year. Um, our undergraduate business and undergraduate IT degrees, the tuition fees are essentially the same. The only difference is our business program does have 122 total credit hours, where our IT program has 120 credit hours. Um, the first semester tuition fees for the undergraduate program is about 89,070 US dollars, and the future semesters will come in around $8,270. And that is due to um, the uh, an international student orientation fee that is applied the first semester that we essentially use that uh, that fee is charged for the purpose of a full eight-week onboarding session for international students, where we teach them everything that they need to know to be successful here in the United States at a, at a weekly seminar that we run. So, and there's there's really lots of things that go into the, that fee, but that's uh, one of the main things for it. So with the undergrad business program, uh, students will take 15 credits per semester. With the exception of two of those semesters, they'll need to take 16 credit hours. They'll finish this program in four years. And for the undergraduate IT programs, this uh, tuition fee quote is based on 15 credit hours per year. I'm sorry, per semester. And I will say some students take less than this, you know, and if a student takes only 12 credits per semester, they're technically still considered full-time students for the purpose of their 
uh, immigration status and their F-1 visa status in the United States, but only taking those 12 credits will extend the amount of time that they need to study in school. So we do encourage students to take those 15 credit hours per semester. And then this is a more detailed breakdown of the tuition for those of you that are interested in seeing this. So um, the undergraduate tuition fee is $515 per credit hour. You multiply that by the 15 credit hours. You add the learner resource fee, which covers the use of all your technology and all your textbooks at the university, um, which is something I actually didn't mention. There's not any uh, unexpected textbook charges at Herzing University. So we use this learner resource fee to cover all of your textbooks, no matter what the price of the textbook is. Um, that's an all-inclusive price for that. Um, also an all-inclusive price for all the other learning resources that you have on campus, tutoring support, IT support, um, all of your technology fees. Um, you'll see a lot of universities have like a really long list of fees that we they charge. We just charge them in a more compact way, basically. Um, also, there's a $5,000 per semester international student uh, service fee, um, the $700 international student orientation fee, which comes up to the total of almost $14,000. And then every semester we'll be giving that $5,000 scholarship, which brings the tuition back uh, down into around $8,970 for the first semester. All right, so I'm going to hop into the graduate admissions requirements now, which again are very similar to the undergrad. So I'm going to kind of go quickly through the things that are exactly the same as the undergrad and focus a little bit more on the things that are different. So again, the electronic application, the in-uni registration form, uh, the passport that needs to be good from six months beyond the start date of classes, financial statements, 60 days or less old, totaling around 30,000 US dollars in any currency and an affidavit of support if the statement doesn't belong to the student, $50 application fee, um, proof of language. These are a little bit different. So you'll see for the master's program, the uh, proof of language scores are a little bit higher than they were for the bachelor's program. So the IELTS is gonna be a 6.0, the TOEFL will be an 80, the Duolingo uh, comes in at a 53. Um, and then again, the suitability interview uh, that is done by someone on the NUNI team. And then undergraduate, I mean, academic transcripts. This is a lot of times where uh, our programs or our applications get hung up. Um, and I see my photo has frozen. Can you guys still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. You are audible, but your photo is stuck here. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully nobody that clears nobody up. You can... <laughs> um, so... Uh, transcript evaluations for uh, are a requirement to be admitted to a master's degree program. Um, and so essentially what we're looking for are two things. One is to be sure that the student has the equivalent of an undergraduate uh, four-year bachelor's degree in the U.S. And then also we're wanting to know what their cumulative GPA is for that undergraduate study that they did. So in order to do that, we will need all transcripts and mark sheets, including failed mark sheets, um, also their degree certificate, where it actually shows that de the degree was awarded. Um, and those can be uploaded to the application portal, um, just in the undergrad in the unofficial transcript line uh, of the document checklist. Um, we will then take those transcripts, we send them to a third party foreign credential evaluator, where they will do the evaluation for us to determine what is the U.S. equivalency of these credentials and what is the cumulative GPA of these credentials. So that process does take about five to seven business days. This is a third party that we send this to. So unfortunately, Herzing doesn't have full control over this. We, are, we will accept outside foreign credential evaluation. So if a student already has an evaluation from another uh, source that is on the NACES approved list of foreign credential evaluators, we will accept it. Um, however, I'll say if a student doesn't have that evaluation done yet, it's best to just go with this option if they're applying to Herzing University because those evaluations typically take six to eight weeks to get completed. So while five to seven days seems like a really long time to wait for this evaluation, it's much less than the six to eight weeks that most other US foreign credential evaluators uh, as far as the time is concerned, that's how long it takes with the others. So um, so what happens in this process is once the application is complete and the application fee is paid, 
only at that point will we send this transcript for evaluation to the third party evaluator. Um, the evaluation report will come back to us. If she was able to verify the credentials online somehow, or if the credentials were sent to us officially, like directly by the school, she will issue um, an official uh, foreign credential evaluator, foreign credential evaluation. If she's not able to verify them, um, she will issue an unofficial foreign credential evaluation, which still allows us to move forward in the application process, but we will notify the NUNI team and we and notify the student that they do have to bring their official transcripts to orientation. So they can bring in officials sealed from the university, their originals. Um, there's a few options for that, but they do have to bring those by orientation because we do have to have an official evaluation on file before classes begin. Um, so that's really uh, the main difference between the undergraduate and the graduate application. So um, no high school credentials are going to be required for the master's application, just these um, undergraduate bachelor's degree credentials will be required for that. So I'll stop here uh, again after the graduate application requirements and ask if there's any questions. Yeah, Shatach, do you have any questions right now? No, I don't have a question on this. That's okay. Much but do you have any question? Uh, none from my side. I think it's pretty straightforward and clear. Thank you, Anissa. Perfect. Okay. 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 Thank have, you. Okay. I have one question, Anissa. Uh, as actually, I have received this question from a couple of students regarding the fees uh, fee structure, because uh, uh, right from here, students actually will pay the uh, one semester fee, and then definitely they'll move back once they get the visa. So what will be the pattern right there once they uh, reach the U.S.? How are they going to pay the remaining fee? Either they're going to they're pay in the installments or the semester wise. So what will be the pattern regarding that? Yeah, Can so fees will be due by the semester. So, um, so basically when a student gets their visa approved, I think we lost Anissa. Could you please um, yes. ask, her, ask her to rejoin? Okay, okay. Um, Shardaj, I think you need to mute. Okay, okay. So this is all from our side. Thank you so much, Farah. Thank um, you for so just much, Asa. Open for a second. I think we're getting a confirmation from Anifa. Could you okay. hold it for oh, another okay. five minutes? Yeah, yes, yeah. So I have just, I just messaged her. I think she'll rejoin. So just wait a couple of minutes. Okay. In the meantime, are there any questions from the audience? Shata, did we get like some questions from the audience? Your Facebook, it was live on Facebook as well, right? Yeah, I know. Let me just check. Okay, amazing. Okay, so did you get the confirmation or should we wind it up? Asif, did you get a confirmation uh, from? I still, I still, did, I still didn't receive the confirmation from her. You didn't receive, okay. Uh, Shaitaj, could you wait for another two, three minutes? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, Asif, in the meantime, could you please uh, share your screen with the presentation yeah. so that we can just, in case yeah, she's uh, unable. Ask some questions. 
Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm yeah. going to share my screen. Is my screen visible to you guys? Uh, yes. It was a minute before. Yeah, now it's visible. Okay, so I wanted to ask the question that what are the benefits of getting a degree from Herzing University? Right. So, um, Shahtaj, as mentioned earlier as well, um, I think one of the main aspects that we really need to understand is the uh, opportunity because most of our students are international mm -hmm. students and the reason mm -hmm. they're opting for international degrees is because of the opportunities that are available within the um, study destination or, you know, other countries as well. So what we have uh, right now is that um, Atlanta, Georgia is a very uh, cent is at a very central you know uh, location in the U.S. And as yeah. for the university, it is located in downtown uh, Atlanta, which means the students have a lot of access to some of the big names, the corporate hubs in Atlanta as well. So Atlanta has been home to Coca Cola. It has it's it, it has a rich history. It's it's very very urban at the same time, and then there is a lot of opportunity to network as well. We've had a lot of alumni from Pakistan itself. So there's a chance of networking as well. So any student graduating from uh, Herzing University will have the opportunity to land job opportunities within the US. Um, at the same time, like mentioned, we do have STEM category programs. So as for the STEM category programs, any student graduating from such a program will get an extension on OPT as well, which is basically the postgraduate work permit, uh, okay. post your, of course, graduation. So you will be able to stay in the US for a total of three years mm -hmm. and uh, work in your career, uh, related career field as opposed to a student who's doing a non STEM program. That student will only get one year of extension, one year actually in total for his work permit. So that is one difference as well. So I think all in all, it's, it's a very good. Um, uh, integrated kind of an institution. Uh, they also offer small class sizes as well. So that means the student have a lot of personalized attention. We're not uh, kind of um, putting the student in a class size of, let's say, you know, 500 students. The class size are very, very small. So that is that. Um, okay. give me, yeah. I, I give have me a moment. Uh, uh, give me a moment. Actually, okay. Anissa is going to join, but she's saying that I'm just unable to join because Host Joao Joani Karpara. She is just waiting for the host to let him let her. Anissa is waiting to join. Okay, yeah. so I want to ask another question. May I? If you yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, sure, okay. sure. So my question is that what could be the reason of rejection from the university? So mainly the reasons are basically academic reasons. So if the student is ineligible academically, that is one reason their application will be rejected. Other than that, if they fail the suitability interview, because we take that very, very seriously also. It's very, very basic, but at the same time, we want to understand the student is who he says he is. He's proficient in English. At the same time, they have some information regarding the program, you know, and the tuition breakdown, and, you know, they're, they're a good fit for the program. So if they're unable to clear that, that is another reason for rejection from the university but that is that um, but at the same time we have kept the eligibility criteria relatively relaxed so as to encourage more students to apply to this university oh uh, Shrataj could you please uh, let Anissa in okay um, ask if you can stop sharing your screen please Welcome back, Anissa. Hey, guys. I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened. Um, no, no, no problem. No problem. So, you can proceed where you left. Yes. So I think I was on the um, the master's degree uh, yeah. tuition. Yeah, you were there. You were um, there. So I'll I'll start through that again. 
So again, as I mentioned, the master's degree program is going to be between 33 and 36 credit hours, totaling four semesters. Uh, first semester tuition around six thousand eight hundred and seventy U.S. dollars, and then future semester tuitions around six thousand one hundred and seventy. Um, and I think whenever I cut off at some point, we were talking about the five thousand dollar non-refundable tuition deposit that will be paid within seven days of receipt of the tuition invoice, and then the remaining tuition balance in this case, uh, one thousand eight hundred and seventy dollars would need to be paid before classes start. And Typically, payments for uh, semester tuition are made semester-wise. Um, however, if there's extenuating circumstances for a student, they can speak to our financial team and ask if there's any way that um, they can make payments um, in maybe two installments for the semester. That's the maximum that she would allow. Um, and she will occasionally do that, but the student does need to have a reason in order to do that. I know there are some U.S. universities that will accept payments uh, or installments, rather, over the course of the semester. Um, but there's not a lot of U.S. universities that do that, so it's not really common practice in the United States, but if there's extenuating circumstances, she may be willing to consider it. So, um, This is a more detailed breakdown of that. Um, since I kind of covered all of this with the undergrad tuition, I'm going to skip over this since we just lost like 10 minutes of time based on the uh, whatever happened with my internet connection there. Um, and then offer letter requirement. So Person will issue conditional offers. Um, as long as we've got everything that we need with the exception of the financial statements um, and the suitability interview. So if, as long as the students submitted their passport, their app fee, their proof of language, their high school diploma for bachelor's degree students, um, their admissions assessment for bachelor's degree students and the undergraduate uh, transcript mark sheets and degree certificate for master's degree students and the evaluation has been completed, we will issue a conditional um, acceptance letter for that student. Um, most of the applicants we get, though, I will say they go ahead and give those financial documents up front, which means most of the time we never have to issue a conditional letter. But if a student wants that, we will absolutely do it. Um, sometimes students are like applying for maybe a bank loan or a scholarship where they need that acceptance letter in advance. And if that's the case, we're absolutely happy to do that. It's part of our regular process. Um, so. Um, and then to get that full offer along with the I-20, um, all those conditional accept conditional items need to be met, but then we'll additionally need the financial statement and affidavit of support, and then the suitability interview to be completed. Um, and the big question is always, you know, how, how long, like how long does it take for us to, to get these? Um, so that moves me on to our next slide here, and we're, we're getting close to the end of the presentation actually. Um, but the processing timeline, we process all documents, applications, assessments, all of those get processed within 24 to 48 hours. Um, we say 48 hours is kind of what our, our standard time is, but they're almost always done within 24. So um, it would be within very rare circumstance, usually around the application deadline when we really get inundated with a lot of applications and documents. Maybe at that point, it may take 48 hours if we get so many. Um, but usually it's within 24 hours. Again, those foreign credential evaluations take five to seven business days for the evaluation to be done. So we have to send the evaluation that's a day, five to seven days for it to be done, and then a day for us to process the results when she gets them back. So that's where you get this eight to 10 days that you see here. Um, an interview uh, by the in-uni team, which usually if you go online and register for that interview, Usually you can get the time within about three days. They have about four different interviewers that are doing those interviews for the team. Um, and once everything is met, that can, unconditional offer letter can usually be issued within about 48 hours along with the I-20 at the same time. So um, our processing times, this is something that we're really proud of these times. There are very few universities in the United States that can deliver these types of processing times. And I can tell you now, we have students, undergrad applicants that apply on Monday and they have I-20s by Friday, but it's, you know, making sure you submit all of those requirements. So if you go in one day and just give us a passport and go in the next day and give us your high school and go in the next day and do your proof of language, you know, that's going to delay out the process, right? Like you're talking, you know, we got to have the, with the time difference and everything, we've got to have time to process. But if someone goes in and submits everything on Monday for an undergraduate bachelor's degree applicant, 
they do everything on Monday, right? They upload their, their bank statements, their passport, whatnot. By Tuesday, they're going to have that exam, right? And we will process all of the documents on the same day that we send that exam, including sending their high school to our own registrar to be reviewed, which that should be back by Thursday. If the student does the exam on Wednesday, we'll review it on Thursday, um, you know, be able to put everything together, submit them for acceptance, and then get them that I-20 by, by Friday. So, um, but again, the student has to, they have to have everything done. So um, I do want to touch on monthly living expenses. I don't think it's any secret around the world. The cost of living is going up for everybody, no matter what country you're in. So this is really important to talk about. Um, we get some students that come over here occasionally that expect to be able to spend two to $300 a month on rent. Um, and I do want to be sure that everybody knows that is not a reasonable expectation to come to the United States with. Um, students, even in a situation where they're sharing apartments, um, are gonna end up paying around $750 a month for rent if they're sharing an apartment with a student. Like this $750 you see here is not necessarily the total cost of the apartment. And then, you know, four students are sharing it. This is literally what we expect the students share of their living expenses to be. And it does depend on the type of living that they have. So we do have some students that have four people living together that the total rent in the apartment is around $2,000. So yeah, they're only paying $500 a month, right? But they still have to have water. They still have to have electricity. They still have to have internet and all of these things. Um, and so we do anticipate that the, the housing cost for a student is going to be the largest expense that they have outside of their tuition. So we really do want students to expect to cover that 750 to 1,000 US dollars for housing. Um, and this is even inclusive of student housing. So if a student wants to live in student housing, we have lots of student housing options and those also range between 750 and 1,000 US dollars per month. So really important that students have the right expectations so they don't come over expecting something you know completely different that is absolutely unattainable. Um, also, Food, again, the cost of everything around the U.S. is going up, and all of these expenses are really going to depend on how the student lives, right? So if this is a student that expects to eat out in restaurants every day, you know, their, their cost of food is going to be much higher than someone who is going to the grocery store um, and cooking their own food um, each day. So something to consider. Um, transportation versus having, you know, public transit versus having a car somewhere between $100 and $500 per month. And then other expenses because things come up, right? Um, maybe they need new clothing. Maybe they need new, a new pair of shoes. Maybe they have to go to the doctor and they have medical expenses. Um, maybe they needed to buy a piece of furniture. You know, whatever that is, you know, they may they may expect to spend between one and five hundred U.S. dollars uh, per month to be able to uh, meet that need. And then all of our I-20s are going to show. Uh, about $13,000 in living expenses per academic year, which covers two semesters or eight months. So that coupled with the tuition is where we get that $30,000 US dollars that a student needs to be able to provide to show that they can cover their first academic year here in the US. Um, these are some of our housing options. So I did want to share some of these photos with you. Um, we are fortunate enough to be in the city of Atlanta and there's lots of universities here. So there is high demand for student housing. Um, and there are lots of options, or, or I'll say lots of universities in the U.S. don't have their own housing and they don't have their own housing because, um, there's so many universities here and the city's kind of dense, right? There's nowhere to build out. And so, um, we're lucky enough to be able to partner with some of these university housing facilities to provide housing to our students. Um, particularly this one that I'm showing you photos of now is Westmar Loft. Um, they're really, really nice places. I mean, I would stay in them. You can look at the photos and see how beautiful some of them are, but yeah, they have really nice rooms. Beautiful. They have, this one has a pool, some more photos that you'll see here, like study areas, fitness center, outdoor grilling, a track. This track that you see here, um, it's actually on top of the building. You know, it's like a, a running course that's up there. It's really cool. And then obviously we saw the pool already. But um, in addition to Westmar Loss, there's about 12 student housing options that are located in the city. Um, and then also we can recommend shorter stay options for students as well. So we do have a relationship with a company called um, 
oh, I just lost, I forget the name of it. I'll have to, I can look it up and provide it to you guys. Uh, Extended Stay America is what okay. it's called. They, um, they provide like longer short stay options at a less expensive cost. So if a student really wants to come in, maybe find a roommate, maybe figure out what part of the city they want to live in, or maybe they don't want to live in student housing, they can sign up to stay in one of the Extended Stay America properties. There's like three that are really close to the campus. And maybe they sign up to stay there for two weeks. You know, it gives them time to, you know, get acclimated to the U.S., figure out where they want to live in the city, maybe meet some friends and decide if they, you know, maybe want to live with another student or, or whatever the case. And it just gives them a little bit more flexibility. If they go with one of the student housing options, those are going to have a one year lease time oh, frame. So okay. students will need to be prepared for that. Um, if they're not interested in the one year lease, the shorter stay options may be better while they, you know, navigate the city to figure out where they would want to stay. Um, and then I believe this is the last slide we have. This is our fall application deadlines. Um, I will say we are still accepting applications for the summer intake, um, but I would only recommend students apply for the summer intake at this point if they have a shot at getting a visa interview before the start date of class, because, you know, obviously it, it is March already. Um, we're accepting applications through, I believe it's March the 17th is the deadline. So we have about, you know, I think through Sunday, I think to do that. So if students want to apply for the summer intake, they can absolutely do that. Otherwise, the next uh, intake date is going to be for the fall where the application deadline is going to be July 17th. Um, we have a date set up for visa notification, tuition fees, arrival of international student, orientation is going to be August the 31st and September 1st, and then the first day of class is going to be um, September the 4th. All right. Oh, I do have one more slide. I'm sorry. Things to remember. Um, these are things that I feel like are really important that, you know, everyone should be sharing with students. The thing number one is the appl applicant should be doing the applications on their own. Um, we absolutely want the support of the team at NUNI, the team at Ocean One to, for students to be able to do these. Because you guys can look at them too and know, like, this isn't going to meet the requirement, right? If you see a student that has a a five on the IELTS, you know, there's really not any sense in submitting that document. It's not going to be accepted. Um, but, you know, you guys can do like an initial proof of those and make sure that everything's going to meet the requirements. Um, and then one of the most important things is students should be using an email address that they check often because they will get communication from the university. And I'll say not only just for those admissions exams, but it's also important when it comes time for a, a student's tuition invoice. It's going to go to that email. And then if they don't get it paid within that seven days, their I-20 is going to be canceled. And when students come and say, I didn't know, you know, I didn't have that email. I don't have access to that. You know, we, we aren't going to accept that as an excuse. Um, additionally, um, whenever they're traveling to the U.S. and then they get here and we can't get in touch with them, you know, it's because we don't have an email address for them. And so... Um, it's really, really important that um, students are using that email address. Um, after they go into the application and they do that initial application and hit submit, it's really important that students wait a couple of minutes and hit refresh. That will populate their application checklist, tell them everything that they need. Um, they should check the application portal regularly for updates because if a document doesn't meet the requirements, we will reject it and we'll tell you why we rejected it. Um, and then also uh, the link again for the application right now. If a student uses this link, it tells me that um, the student is uh, referred through a partner of in uni. Um, and then I also, I do know that Ocean One is really good about filling in where it says, how did you hear about Herzing? You guys are really good about helping the student fill in uh, Ocean One. So we usually know that it came from you guys. So, um, and I think that's it. That's the last slide that I have today. So we can open up for a few questions if you guys still have some time. Thank you very much for your session. It was a very thank interesting you. session, Anissa. Yes, and thank you very much for your time. Uh, actually, I have taken you a very short notice and you have definitely joined. You have to join the jury duty as well. So thank you very <laughs> much for your session. You actually have covered almost all the latest updates regarding the STEM MBAs, regarding the proficiency of PTE as well. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that are quite interesting updates for us and definitely we're going to recruit some good numbers from Pakistan, especially from Ocean One as well. And now over to uh, Shataj, if you have any question, pending questions. No, so I would just like to say thank you all of you for enlightening all these facts about Herzing University. 
I hope it will help these students a lot. Okay, yes, okay, thank so you. And again, if if you guys want to do this again in a few weeks, or maybe do it after, you know, maybe in, in May after the launch of the STEM MBA, even, I'm happy to do that. You know, you guys, if you just give me a few days, you know, I can usually arrange my schedule to, to make sure, it work. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Anything from Farah? No, I think it was very, very fruitful um, webinar. And thank you so much, Anissa, for taking out the time for us. Ocean One is one of our key partners, and we've received some exceptional response for uh, housing, especially. So I believe, um, you know, in the future, we're going to have a successful collaboration. And uh, definitely, it's basically Ramadan over here. So we're just yeah. nearing uh, the time where we have to break the fast. So we're not going to keep anyone any longer. But thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, all of you. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, of Thank course, Asim uh, will keep you posted for future um, sessions as well. I think this was really great, and I think we must do that for a STEM program especially. So we have a lot of, um, you know, influx of applications towards a STEM program. So definitely, I think uh, we're going to do that. Sure, sure. Sure, right. sure, sure. All right, Thank guys. you very well, much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. It was See really you nice soon. to meet all Take of you. Thank you, Anita. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Asim. Bye, bye. Take care.